I'm a chef. And this is what I've done for the last 25 years. And one of the things that I've, because I'm in the southern United States, it's a place with a lot of food history. And it's got an, it's, it's a painful history because they're just realizing that the, you know, it's not their food. It came on the backs of slaves. It's a difficult time down there. Um, but the other thing they're fighting with is this idea of what great food is. And when you say Southern food, a lot of people think it's fried chicken and biscuits, and it's the food that kills you. And it's not. It's this beautiful agrarian and agricultural and vegetable react laden plate and table rich with choices. But one of the things that's happened in the last 50 years, or even more specifically to the late 1940s, was that, you know those old spiral-bound notebooks of cookbooks from your church or local community center or whatever it may be? They went from having these beautiful recipes that were very simple and very pure and all natural ingredients and simple, and then suddenly we see jello, <laughs> and we see cream of mushroom soup, and all these convenience foods start, and then the freezer aisle starts, and then salad dressings become something you never make at home and you just buy them off the shelf, and then fast food has a massive impact and rolls out. And we see these things having big, big impact on health, mostly in the southern United States, but now it's emanated everywhere. So one of the things that really I noticed is a sort of ten tangent of that is that nobody makes jam with their mother. <laughs> we made jam, we made jam with our grandmothers, right? <laughs> but for most of us, we skipped a generation on learning how to cook because our mothers fell prey to the idea of not cooking from scratch anymore and falling into convenience. So what is from scratch cooking? Well, let me run through. I'm not perfect, by the way. I drove here to a rental car late last night in the pouring rain eating Saint Hubert fries <laughs> with <laughs> gravy on the sides <laughs> because we're in Quebec. So cooking from scratch, though, means it's a reaction to your community. It's an immersion into your area. It's an immersion into when I grew up in, in Ottawa and was cooking at um, a place, a very famous place that's now no longer called Café Aré Berger in, in Hull. Um, I cooked there for a long time and it was such a beautiful French restaurant and such a reaction to whatever. The, the meats came from Bing. It's a guy we knew and he raised them and the cheeses came from his wife and other people brought the cream in and all the vegetables came in that way. It, we weren't 100% all local and this is 30 years ago, that were 20, 25 years ago. So this is a really long time ago. But it was farm to table before, before farm to table was a term that we could co-opt and slap on any restaurant. Um, and so it meant cooking from your environment. And so if I go to the farmer's market and figure out what's in my local area, that's going to be automatically I'm cooking with the seasons if it's a good farmer's market, right? It's more difficult up here because it's colder and the seasons are shorter, um, but you learn to love cabbage. Um, <laughs> But what cooking from scratch really means, and I think what we're ripping away from young Americans and young Canadians, is your ability to survive in this world and give yourself, survive for yourself and give yourself a really healthy mandate in life. Fast food is the, this age of convenience that overtook us, just it weights us down in a really not a great way. So that's where we are right now. Um, so we're in this age of convenience and we need to fight against it. And what unfortunately has happened mostly in the United States is that the, the age of convenience has really, really impacted lower income Americans. So it's a really, really difficult time in the states to try and figure these things out. Type 2 diabetes and obesity rates are really, really off the charts. And they thought that type 2 diabetes and obesity rates in the last three years were going down, and they were until Obamacare came in, and then actually everybody started going to the doctor. So the rates went up. No, the, the rates in the last six months have gone way up because none of those people could afford to go to the doctor before. So if you're Canadian, uh, thank your lucky stars. Um, <laughs> So what we have to do now is we have to instill respect for food again. And it's really, really important. If I go to my cottage north of Toronto and we wait for corn season and I see the kids who are six, seven years old and they know what corn season is and they know that tomato season comes right after corn season and they understand that blueberries and strawberries come in the early part, raspberries and blackberries towards the end of summer. And that is a respect for food and an understanding of food that most kids just do not have the luxury of knowing anymore. We need to make sure that food becomes precious to us again. It becomes treasured. 
and respected. The problem with food is we made it the lowest common denominator. We've made it very unimportant and it's just a matter of sustenance. And it's become very, very, very boring. So we want to go and we need to empower. But I kept thinking about this. And I kept thinking like, how do we empower our kids? I've got two kids, Beatrice who's 13 and Clementine who's 11. Beatrice, when she was five years old, I remember her, uh, she was going off to kindergarten for the first day and she, I'm a chef and we live in a house that, again, we still love, ch down south we love like Chick-fil-A. It's, <laughs> it's a confused sandwich, but it's a good sandwich. Um, politically not so good a company. But I could hear her in the kitchen and she was making a vinaigrette from scratch. She was five and she was making a salad and she was getting ready to go to the first day of kindergarten. She's very excited and this is a very empowered young person who was awesome. And so she was doing this, making a clatter, a crazy amount of noise in the kitchen. And I woke up and I went to see if she needed help and what she was doing. And she was shaking her vinaigrette in the mason jar, <laughs> had her salad, all the spread and all this like little salumi off to the side. It was a really beautiful balanced meal. It was just like, it was touching to me and I was really proud, but it was like, that's a life skill that she'll never forget. So I got to thinking, like, how do we instill these life skills in people that will, they will never forget them? Everybody in this world should know how to poach an egg, but I'm going to go on to that more. So Beatrice ages gets to 11. This is two years ago, and she comes back from her, uh, we're big public school proponents. And she comes back from middle school, and she says, I took my first home economics class. And home economics is called family and consumer sciences now. Um, they got away from the gender equality issue of it, home ec seeming to become just about raising babies. And so I said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, we learned how to, she, she's 11, um, we learned how to take prenatal vitamins. I was like, why do you need to, why, well, it's not an ethical issue to me, but it is an issue of, why do you have to teach somebody to take a vitamin? It's on the other side of the bottle. Turn it over, read, and take the vitamin, you're done. So, and then they made uh, red velvet cupcakes, which are like bright red, dyed red cupcakes in the south with sort of a cream cheese ice, uh, frosting, but they made it from an instant box. And then they took uh, croissants uh, from a tube, <laughs> pulled them, and put really cheap bacon around them and, and baked them in the oven. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? What? So I called the, uh, the friend of mine is the school superintendent and he's a really nice guy. He's really progressive and just got the job. So he's like, yeah, I said, hey, uh, Beatrice just got home from her class and she said that this is what they learned. I was like, what do you, what do you think? He's like, I know. I'm canceling it for next week. Let's have a meeting next week and we'll talk about it. So I went in and talked to him and this guy is Phil Lanou. He's a really, really interesting guy. And he just... He, he, he and I just had the same idea and that we wanted to teach these kids how to empower themselves, no matter where they came from, how to give them some life skills. So I started thinking about it and Phil was like, well, do you want to write the curriculum? I was like, I'm a chef and I work 95 hours a week and I travel the world and I do a lot of different things and I'm always everywhere. I don't really have that much time. So I said, yes. <laughs> so. That is something that we call seed life skills. And seed life skills is taking, it's very easy because it's taking the existing class structure and the existing class time and the amazing amount of things that we have in our neighborhood. This school has chickens, it has goats, it has a huge, massive garden. They just don't use the stuff enough. They, and they, so it's not, it, they're very, very separated, parallel, curriculums. One is raising these wonderful agricultural things and then one is teaching them how to cook really crappy basic food that's not even really cooking. It's again falling prey to the age of convenience. So I said, well, why don't we do it in nine segments? And first thing, we, you know, we teach them how to make amazing smoothies and use of dairy and make cheese from scratch. I don't want to raise precious chefs. I just want to raise kids who understand food and can then feed themselves. The second one would be cooking from grains. In the late 1940s, rice production in the United States of America, which was very rich in, this, in, in a lot of areas, mostly in the center of the country in Texas, and it used to be along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, um, but that was it, completely powered by slavery, so when the Civil War happened, that whole economy fell apart and it moved inland. It's a really weird, interesting history. But the problem with rice production in the United States, and this is around the world, is rice has been, has been geared to be raised and, and grown so cheaply that it's stripped of all nutritional value. 
Hence, we have enriched rice because uh, a president a long time ago figured out that the soldiers were really weak and it's because they weren't getting any vitamins from the really crappy rice they were eating. So this is again, this is how we fix our food system. We take, we take something that's so basic and stripped of all nutritional value and we say, let's not go back to raising it correctly again, which would have nutrition in it and its natural case. No, we add a bunch of chemicals to it and put them into our body to make it whole again. So it's teaching kids how to make real rice, not minute rice. It's teaching kids how to, the understanding of farro and wheat berries and split peas and legumes and things from scratch, not in a can. There's a place for canned goods, but it's not in everybody's larder for every meal of every time. But that's the, mo that's the important thing about fighting and changing the food system right now. It's become so easy. So for the average American, breakfast is Dunkin' Donuts, lunch is McDonald's, and di dinner is Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we think that's a treat. When I was raised young, I mean, that Kentucky Fried Chicken was like, woo, this is crazy. <laughs> you, you did that? And that was like every year. And then now people eat this stuff five, six days a week, and then we wonder why you know, they we're, we're really struggling as a society and, and we're struggling for health a lot in a lot of our ways. So the third one is making salads and salad dressings. Look, I love a lot of these companies. Newman's Own makes a lot of salad dressings and I do a lot of work with Newman's Own and they've given my foundation a lot of money and they're very sweet people. But the salad dressings, I can make you a salad dressing in 35 seconds. So can you. Salad dressing is a ratio. A ratio in food is a beautiful thing because it brings simple knowledge to some something complex in flavor. So it's three to one, oil to acids. You can make a salad dressing. You can flavor it with whatever you want. You can add in whatever you want, but all it is is a ratio. And so if I teach a kid that, he's always got that arsenal of a weapon to live, a weapon to survive, because he's got this idea of a core construct. So this other idea that we're constantly fighting against, that good food is expensive. Good food is not expensive. So sure, like biologic and uh, for like fully organic stuff in the United States and in, in, in Canada is, is more expensive. We're moving towards that stuff and that stuff's gonna creep down in price. I'm the sentiment economist. So slowly but surely, those things will become attainable. But in the meantime, there's so much food that is attainable that people could cook every day for really not that much money. But we have to make sure we have to make sure that the preciousness of food is not wrapped up in a white chef coat on TV or in fancy restaurants and things like that. I still want you to come to restaurants. I pay my mortgage that way. <laughs> So it's making salads, making vinaigrettes. The fourth one is pickling and preserving. The idea of, of taking food in a moment of abundance and keeping it for the rest of the year. The idea of preserving that gives kids a lot of science uh, impact uh, on, their on their brains and what they're learning in the fact of what is salt doing, what is vinegar doing to preserve food for the long term. So, and that's a skill that a lot of people have forgotten how to do. Next is like cooking a chicken and poaching an egg. So if I have a video of Jacques Papin showing everybody in this world how to poach a perfect egg and then us, me and Tom Colicchio roasting the perfect chicken and you never forget how to do that because it's impact stuff. It's really so simple and just driven into your mind that that's how we cook. So it's, um, then it's personal finance. Everybody, if you took home economics, we learned how to balance our checkbooks and nobody balances their checkbook because we all look online. But I want to teach kids all how to um, read a cell phone contract, which nobody in this room knows how to do. Um, and then what are we checking when we check all the boxes every day on the computer saying, oh, I acknowledge and accept these terms. <laughs> You know, you click these things, we don't, even, we don't even pay attention. So we don't understand, and also kids don't understand. When I was 18 and moved to Montreal to go to Concordia, I had no idea how to sign my first lease. Nobody had ever, ta ever taught me that. We had no idea what to do when we, when we signed up for our first hydro bill. And our, you know, all these things, we just had no idea. Nobody, even the son of an economist, my dad had never said, hey, don't sign up for a 20% APR credit card. That's probably not very smart. You know, and don't lease your first car. That's a big ripoff. You know, nobody's teaching these kids these really survival and street skills that they need to know. So that's the new home ec. So again, it's in consumer empowerment. Then it's a lot of fixing stuff. Um, my mother didn't teach me many things. It's a long story, we'll talk later. Um, but she did teach me how to sew. 
And sewing has been really, really impactful for me. And girls thought it was cool when I was in college. Um, <laughs> so fixing things, like as opposed to just throwing things away, it's like the toaster is never fixed anymore. The toaster is thrown away. The microwave is thrown away. The TV is thrown away. And we can only throw so many things away until we realize that we don't have much room and then we're throwing things away in the national park. So, you do, and then it's just a matter of life hacks and figuring things out. But this has to be for all kids. So this is like core ideas of survival. And I don't think that's really what we're doing. So we're in the process right now of writing the curriculum, of figuring everything out, of wrapping it into something. And we're greenlit for four middle schools starting in next fall. So I've hired one person, and it's a really exciting time um, to show uh, people that I can raise people who are gonna fight a good fight for this next generation. Because a lot of kids, I think, are just, they don't have any hope. So in the, southern, in the south, in my community, in Athens, Georgia, I have a friend who works with a lot of underprivileged kids in a project, and one of them said that her grandmother, it, uh, type two diabetes is so prevalent in African American communities, it's, it's insane obesity and type 2 diabetes, and it's all diet related. And so the, this kid who's 13 says, oh, my grandmother just got diagnosed with severe type 2 diabetes and she's probably gonna die, and my mother just got it too. And I, and I was like, or this, my friend was like, wow, okay, that's kind of heavy. And she was like, it's okay, I'll get my grandmother's medicine when I get it. <laughs> it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I need to raise people in my community who are going to be saying, no, 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 this stops here. We're gonna make food from scratch and we're gonna feed ourselves really well. We're gonna change this world slowly but surely with little steps. But that goes to you too and your family. It's a call to action to sort of improve your scenario. And then you get into your community and you empower your community and you figure things out. No one at the end of life is going to lament cooking well for their family, right? Nobody laments, oh geez, I wish I had spent $3 less on that bottle of olive oil. What you do do is, I don't want to spend my life in the line waiting for fast food. I want to spend it with my family cooking from scratch and having them watch things and learn things and know that when they get to 25 or 20, like 18, I used to have, a, because I've been, I've been cooking since I was 14 years old, so I go to Concordia and I'm living on St. Andre in, in Montreal and all my friends would come over, like 12 people, and put in $2 into a hat and I would go out to the store and, and feed them all. And usually it's like spaghetti carbonara and a big salad and you know coffee afterwards and maybe return the empties and buy some beer. Um, <laughs> but I had the wherewithal and the skills to do that because I'd been doing it for years. We need every kid in this country and in the States too to learn how to do that at a young age so they never forget it. Because I want kids who are proud. Because I don't want kids who are sleepy because of what they're eating every day. So it's... This idea as well is a lot to do with the book I just wrote, which is bringing vegetables to the center of the plate. And this is another thing about economics of fine food. Have you noticed that 20 years ago, your protein size for a steak would have been 10 ounces, right? Pretty big, massive steak. Now it's four. <laughs> it's because protein prices went up. And they went up for you. They went up for me as a restaurateur, too. Um, and we just can't afford it, too. So we got better at cooking vegetables, which was great. Remember how everybody hated Brussels sprouts? <laughs> We learned how to cook Brussels sprouts. Remember how everybody hated steamed broccoli? We learned how to beautifully roast broccoli and get caramelization on it. Cauliflower, same thing. Cabbage, same thing. Cabbage, we just learned how to cook in the last two years, I think it's been in magazines. Charred cabbage. Charred everything right now, but <laughs> charred cabbage. Um, so that, that progress in vegetables brings that to the center of the plate. It makes my protein size smaller and better for me because I don't need that much protein. And it makes the prevalence of this amazing array of vegetables around it really, really important because I have the skill set and I want everybody to have the skill set to give that full show of what's at the market. So my new cookbook is called The Broad Fork and it's a, uh, a reaction to uh, what's in the CSA box. So I get a CSA every year, so that's Community Supported Agriculture. And so it's from a farm and you subscribe to it. So it's $25 a week and I get a box of vegetables and that's it. You know, the box that comes, but you don't know what you're getting. So I had this one very annoying man uh, who lives down the street uh, and at the drop-off point where they drop them all off they drop like 200 boxes off and we all go to the front porch pick it up sign our name off and go and this guy would be like what do you do with this what do you do with that and the one thing that he was fixated with was kohlrabi what do you do with kohlrabi and he was so 
he was he's an ancient professor, like ancient, like eighty five. He's but he's also he's grumpy, um, and he he kept putting me on the spot about it. And so finally, I started documenting and writing what I do. So that's the book is four to five recipes for each thing on how to get through all of this strange questions of I have crazy amount of lettuce in my fridge and what do I do with it? But in the meantime, the more important thing is you guys. You're gonna fend on your own. You're fine. I like you all. But what we need to do and pay attention to is the next generation, because they can't be caught in this age of convenience forever. We need to teach them how to cook from scratch. And that's really the future of all of this. OK, thanks. The story of moon juice starts when I'm five. And I grew up in Manhattan, and I was in very poor health, and that was grounded in my bronchioles. And we had gone through the pipe of Western medicine,